Anyone attracted by the glamour of the Royal Marines can find all he wants of it on the Brecon Beacons any February afternoon. These young officers in the fifth of their 12 months of training can't speak too highly of the glamour. There's, there's no such thing as um, waterproof clothing, garments. These don't exist. Everything gets wet. It's like socks and gloves. You can stow under your armpits or, uh, or in your groin uh, to, keep, to keep dry. It's not very pleasant to insert. They do heat up within a couple of hours. You've got a dry pair of socks, which is uh, severely good news in these conditions. But that's, are you carrying little packages under your arm? <laughs> Get out the, the goods here if I can. Yeah, that's a. They've been in about half an hour, and you know they're still damp, but they're drying off. I can feel they're drying off already, and uh, well, I, won't, I won't bother to go into what's down there. But I've got some more stuff. <laughs> I've got a pair of gloves down there. So it tends to get me down a bit. Uh, if I do think about uh, home, warm things, things like that, I just I quite frankly I just switch off. But switching off is not a popular concept in the Marines. Switching off is what civilians do. Now, what worries me at this stage is that your personal, first of all, your personal standards of patrolling and skills have fallen off the plot, as far as I'm concerned. You must get a grip of your personal skills, your patrolling skills, your individual skills. Because if you don't, when you're a troop commander, the standards you reflect will very rapidly be reflected for better or worse than the blokes you command. Let me put it Civilianship, in short, is a nasty FDS habit that has to be renounced. Yes, they have, as you say, vestigial traces of, uh, of the civilian still in them, uh, which I think is perhaps a bit disappointing at, at this stage. Uh, I think they really will affect their transformation uh, over the course of the next 10 to 14 weeks, which leads them up to their commando course and their Green Beret. They'll, they'll criticise me for this, but to me at the moment, it is, it is a job. It's not a way of life. I haven't become a military person. I think I've said before that at the weekends, I'm a civilian. And I, I will be a civilian. I'm my own person. And they're not going to create a military stereotype out of me um, and I'm not going to, going to become just a soldier. I'm, I'm going to be me first, uh, and then we'll see what happens. For his three days on a bleak mountainside, Peter Cameron, a Cambridge graduate, has brought an appropriate book. Well, a book called Hard Times uh, by Charles Dickens. So. The training is remorseless. When it's not marching or the mountains, it's the lecture room. Glasnost is not high on the curriculum. Here, they meet the enemy. Well, good afternoon, gentlemen. Essentially, the object of our intellectual attentions this afternoon is this chap, the Soviet soldier, and the way in which he thinks. On this picture here, we see a senior sergeant kissing the Soviet flag. And the caption reads, they remain faithful to the heroic traditions of our army and of our people. It's Afghan army which protects Afghanistan, not Soviet. We do, uh, we conduct um, protection means, protect socialism. And socialism is, uh, you know, an inevitable course. It is progressive social structure. And by words of Lenin, by Lenin's, uh, words of Brezhnev, by words of uh, Marxism, uh, socialism is an international inevitability. It is like exciting experience. When it rains on Saturday, you should just lie back and enjoy it. I find the physical the most difficult part about, about the whole course, especially with the commander training coming up. The training just seems to, to drain your body all the time. It's 11 p.m. After another exhausting day, Jim Trotman craves nothing more than sleep. But there's still homework to be done. What eventually will he dream about? Um, <laughs> home. Uh, outside life, really. Once, once you get under your... Um, your duvet, then it's uh, it's a different world. It's uh, until the alarm goes off at uh, quarter past six again. Mainly, I'm so tired. And I just wake up. I hit the head, hits the pillow. Next thing I know, quarter past six, and off we go again. 
Right, shut up, Mr. Thorpe. Listen, it's my turn to talk, if you don't mind. What we're going to do today, now that you have completed part of your tactical training, is just do a small pause and consider what you've learnt so far and try and generate a new spirit for the rest of your tactical training. And what I'm trying to refer to now is a generation from knowledge, pure knowledge, which is what we've been teaching up to now, to the application of a bit of individual flair. Each officer takes his turn commanding extremely realistic exercises. Right. Get them the section commander and go around and place them in their melks. Best thing to do, okay, is to get all the section commanders in on you, all right, and tell them exactly where you want to put them out. Okay, It'll sir. save a lot of shouting and drama. Right, sir. Mr. Jay, come here! David, stay there! Move! Move! There are tanks, fighters, live explosives, and real CS gas. Gas, gas, gas! What you need to do, or you should reorg your section from 12 to 4 o'clock. Yeah. There. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Well done, good man. Get Mr. Amos on me. Right, 84 millimetre. I want you 12 o'clock on the road, covering the tanks. Go down the road. Stay this side of the road. Yeah. Good. Right. You want All we've got to do is face up the road. That's all right. I've got it. I've got it. Right. Troop sergeant, start getting around these blokes, checking their arcs. Get all the cash ammo states off them. Start there on the ones. I'm very pleased with the way it went, and uh, I think the DSR too. I hope they are. Enjoyed it. Best bit of the exercise so far for me. I love it. It's great. Really did. They put me on such a high. Brilliant. Really was. Right. Today we're going to grid 598682, which is an old mine. Thank you. But for others, the course has become too much. One of them is Colin Young, who enlisted straight from a school career in which he wasn't used to coming second. Opting out requires courage too. He's to join a company called WH Smith. I came to the end of December and the Marines said to me that I wasn't good enough and I need to improve a lot to get up to the grade that they required. So during January I gave 100%, got to the end of January, I finished an exercise and they said, well, we still don't really think you're there. So I sort of sat down and thought about it, rang up a lot of friends, so from parents, and decided eventually that if I was going to be in a career I wanted to do well at my career, because I'd done well at school in what I did and what I enjoyed, so a change of direction was needed, so I went to see Captain, well, Lieutenant Darwell Stone at the time. And I went, took a week's leave, think about it, and the end of the week I decided to leave the Marines, resign. But I think if I had a year off and gone, done, sort of gone around the world, looked after myself for a year, and lived away from home, I'd have been much better. I'd probably stood much better chance and had no problems with the course. Physically, I wasn't too bad. I mean, because I was sort of fit anyway when I went in. And I got on OK with that. It was more, actually, the management side of it, and the fact that I was with people who were better than me, which I'd never been in a situation like that before. I'd previously been at school, I was sort of like the best at sport. And no problem whatsoever. And suddenly I'm in a situation where everybody's sort of fitter than me and better mentally than me and better grades at A-level, whatever. And sort of problems there. Do you think either, though, that, that, that five and a half months has, has, has helped you in, in your new career? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I sort of grew from being a school kid to an adult in those six, six months, whatever it was. Definitely, yeah. Some young men come before me uh, and request to resign. Uh, and the core uh, is very sad about it and wishes they would stay. In other cases, some young men come before me and request to resign, and I think there's a mutual understanding that that is probably a wise course of decision. And in uh, a few cases, we ask a young man uh, to leave because we don't believe that he would be uh, suitable. And some of them join, having been through the potential officer's course, the Admiralty Interview Board, uh, and visits where they become more aware of what the Corps is about, but they join and they get into it and they find that really this life is not for them. This military life is not for them. And that is totally understandable. Uh, and there are many people for whom the military life just does not suit. There's good reason to pay close attention to these exercises in peaceful Devon lanes. Six months from now, some will be doing it for real in Northern Ireland. Right, and where have you just come from? Where do you live? Where do I live? I live in Exeter. Have you just driven from Exeter just now? Yes, I have. Right, and gentlemen, what? if you could drive along the... Just, draw up. just to where the man in the green jacket is standing, pull the car to the side of the road and get out of the car. Where you've got some room to give another vehicle a chance to pass. In the left now, please. Now! Stop it! Yep. 
You've really got to have a good thing, you know, if I shoot this bloke or if I attempt to shoot him. It's like the world's stop, biggest court of inquiry. Stopping a vehicle if it doesn't want to stop. I mean, is it somebody who's just not going to stop for the sake of it or is it too terrorist? We spend a lot of our time here really teaching you the disciplined application of extreme violence, which is basically what we do. And it's strange then to come to a package like this counter-revolutionary warfare, where we actually have to say to you, switch that off, because that's not the game. And in this case, more force was used, and there is absolutely no doubt that that situation would have ended up in a court of law, and the person responsible would undoubtedly have received some form of punishment in a civil court. That incident, demanding instant decision, provokes them to consider their work ethic, killing people. Given it a bit more thought, certainly since I've been in training, but I think I'll, 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 have, to, I'll have to do it really, if, as a troop commander, one day. And it might be a decision that you regret afterwards, but responsibilities to the men and the job. What I dread is is after the situation. You know, I have actually taken somebody's life. You know, and you you know you automatically think of uh, whoever it may be, whether it be um, Soviets or whatever. You know, you you think. There's somebody's, somebody's son, isn't it? Most weekends are free, but for a very good reason, they don't leap into sports cars and dash up to London for a night in Annabelle's. You sleep for six or seven hours like a log, and then you wake up tired again. You've got to go, you know what I mean? You, you wake up, uh, you know, rings around your eyes and everything. It's an effort to lift yourself off the bed, and you get up and get going again. The blokes run down a bit, so... Um, their bodies are not working as they should do, so they're not repairing as well, and uh, getting all pussy and everything, going, going septic. Listen, with the webbing burns on your back, then they're just not healing up at all. <laughs> this chap over here, he's got hideous webbing burns, you want to see them. What about the one behind my ear? He's got one that's spoiled my ear. Get that bit of skin off and put yeah. it in your, in your pie, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are, they obviously get worse than that. There are blokes <laughs> much worse, but they constant rubbing, you know? and uh, it's just more or less a burn, that's all it is. I've always found fishing quite, uh, quite relaxing. Certainly at the end of the week, you're ready for a break. It's, uh, it's, it's good to get away from the, the regular crowd, to do something different. It seems a bit ironic, really, that we slog our guts out most of the time on Dartmoor, way through bogs. And, uh, Ford streams and things, and then it's exactly what I come and do at the weekends as well. So, and, uh, I still quite like Dartmoor. <laughs> I think, in many ways, I'm pretty much unemployable as your average office type worker, and I think many of the people in the batch are. And I find many of the, the lectures now very mundane, and rather some of them. Better watch what I'm saying here. <laughs> Do you ever think about uh, what is going to happen very shortly? Y you could be joining a commando unit going to Northern mm. Ireland. Yeah. It... Yes, I do, actually. I think, uh, I think maybe a lot of people don't. But uh, I, I think about it quite a lot. Along what sort of lines? Um, along the lines of just you wonder how you'd cope in that situation, because nobody knows just what's, what they're going to do. The first time they really run into some trouble. Nobody knows what's going to happen, how they're going to cope, what their men are going to think of them after it, or you know, maybe they'll get the sack, you know, maybe they'll get shot, or, or you know, Kazovac, or whatever. Slowly, the metamorphosis from civilian to soldier is taking place. How do their own friends regard them now? Sometimes they treat you with a bit of awe, and sometimes a bit of suspicion, because you're in the forces, and sometimes because you're in. Um, an organisation which represents as the, the Queen, the country, whatever. They sometimes think, hmm, you know, is he still OK, as it were? Joining for Queen and Country was not a prominent reason for me. I wanted to join um, because I enjoyed the outdoor life and I wanted to have the responsibility. It does come into it, Queen and Country, but it wasn't my prominent reason. So I, I never really get derided uh, or, or laughed at for it. Uh, in fact, a couple of my friends sort of wish they'd done the same thing in a way, I think. I don't think they treat me differently. I probably treat them a little bit more differently. Oh, they, well, they, they take me the same way, but I, I look at them and it, it's, it's 
probably very pompous, but you, you automatically, you think, oh, well, you know, they've not done what I've done. For many, this is the turning point. Out there, the civilians, the civvies, but you are now Royal Marine. My girlfriend uh, said I once went to see her and I was talking about the civvies and she, she hit me and said, well, I'm one. Um, but we do, we walk around and if you see someone with pink hair and whatever, you know, bloody civvy. It's a strange sort of um, standard they put on you because you're so much, you feel so much cleaner because, you know, you're doby two or three times a day at times and, you know, you wash your shirts each night, etc. You just feel cleaner in a way than everyone else around you. I feel I've changed. I've grown up a lot, having come in straight from school, mixing with these guys who, some of them six years older than me. I've had to grow up fast, and I think I've got a little bit more confidence as well. Um, and I've had, I've had to use that confidence to bridge all the problems that I've had, all, all, all the, the little walls there are to climb before you get there in the end. The crucial commando tests are about to start. Peter Ainsworth, who won no marks for arriving on the course in an RAF bomber jacket, has a severe ankle sprain. I'm sure with enough strappings and enough um, painkillers, I'll get through. Yeah. But I'll get through somehow. Stand by. Go. The commando tests, quite simply, are what separate the civilian from the marine. Five weeks of an endurance course, a Tarzan assault course, speed marching, and a 30-mile yomp all carrying 35 pounds against the clock. Very good. Well done, gentlemen. One of the better nine-mile speed marches I've seen <coughs> off a batch. Well done indeed. Ainsworth vibrates with pain after the speed march. Another man, having come this far, decides it's no longer worth it. He quits and walks from the Royal Marines forever. The Tarzan Assault Course is simply the last place you need to discover a fear of heights. Jim Morris did just that, so they sent him straight round again. Okay, so I'm going to cut the test. Into the nose, out through the mouth. 
Did I or you? Did I? Right, so what you did was a good effort, but you did it in 11.45. You'll get a rerun on Saturday, all right? That 15 seconds should go. Okay, sir? Okay, sir. You've got to cross there, you've got to cross the chasm. Stop. All right, you've got over what was your problem, all right? That is your first run, you know that. So you can't complain on 11.45, all right? You know now you've got 15 seconds to knock off. Right, okay, sir. And you can do it. Stuff. All right? Okay, sir. Fall in with the rest of them. One week of nightmare anxiety later, Morris ran again. He beat the qualifying time by a remarkable 30 seconds. OK, Jess, well done this morning. Good effort. Well, welcome to the 30-miler brief, your last test of the commando course. 30 miles across the moor from Oakhampton down to a place called Cross Furzes, which is near Buckfastley. The whole thing to be completed in seven hours. By syndicate. 30 miles in seven hours, carrying one third of a hundredweight. Nice big breakfast, sir. Nice big breakfast. No, they won't give you a cereal on 30 miles. Nice big breakfast. Make sure you get sat down, you sir. You've got your plates got on. Everybody's a bit nervous. Uh, I don't think anybody slept particularly well last night. It was really hot in the accommodation. It's going to be everybody's combined effort. Stacks of umfa. Uh, some chap shouldn't even be walking that alone the 30 mile. Uh, I've had it nice a couple of times yesterday, my ankle. And um, it's been heavily strapped up, so I can't actually move it very well. I just, you know, hopefully it'll hold out. Yeah, I don't reckon I've ever walked 30 miles, let alone run 30 miles in my life. Yeah. Nervous. I don't think anyone is. What are, what, are, what are you prepared to do in order to, to get through this? Yes. Unstable weather. You're the only man here who looks like he's done 30 miles before he starts, Mr. Ray. Well, I'm always this ugly. <laughs> well, I didn't get any sleep last night. I could not sleep. But I don't feel too bad overall. Apart from the old ankle, but that's by the by. You're looking forward to it, though, Mr. Coulson. I've waited for this moment for a very long time. <laughs> well, Mr. Coulson, <laughs> since you're looking forward to it so much, you've got ten seconds to go. Excellent. On your marks. <laughs> Mr. Father Gill, get with him. <laughs> yep, sir. Okay. Okay. Get some of these fluids down the neck, straight in there, fruit, fruit. I say, get it down, sip it, sir, don't gulp, gulp it. I'm rapidly running out of pencils. <laughs> running out of pencils. I've got about two left. For those who make it in time, there awaits the Green Berry, a symbol of graduation into one of the world's most renowned fighting units. It's no macho stunt. In the Falklands War, this man, Brigadier Andrew Whitehead, 
marched 4-5 commando the entire length of West Falkland, each man carrying 120 pounds. When they got there, they had a battle to fight. Ainsworth hobbles on in the wake of that tradition. They've got a problem because they've uh, they made them a navigational error on the first leg, which slowed them down. They're also carrying a guy who we knew was injured. So they are pretty pressed. I mean, they've been running for four hours, 21, um, and they really need to complete the next leg in about the next 35 minutes if they'd have a fighting chance of getting in. What happens if they don't? Quite simple, they go around again. We have to do a rerun. Top of your water bottles over there on the left. To get the pies down you. It's important to eat the whole of the pie. Mr. Phillips. It may slow you down. Okay. You All right. Get yourself pasty. Hot wet over here. Hot wet over here. Tea sirs on the left. There's the orange and the water in the centre. What I'm intending to do now is to actually speak to the instructor, probably pull back the one guy who, through no fault of his own, is, is injured, uh, to give the others at least a fighting chance of getting in. I mean, they can still do it, but they're going to have to work damn hard. But Ainsworth refuses to be pulled up, and such is the team spirit now that his colleagues wouldn't drop him anyway. Okay, well done, men. That's terrific. Well done, guys. Well done. Head to the field. Well done, guys. Good effort. Good effort. Sirs, listen in. Okay, so drop your kit where it is. In syndicates. Well done, one section. You aged me 20 years. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. You're an Good effort, sir. Well done. Good effort. John. Um, oh, uh, Tim Worthy. <laughs> Where are you, man? Well done, man. Well done. Good effort, sir. Well done. Straight in. Straight in. Heads up. Well done, Jay. Well done. 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 Well
The green hat's on your head. Leading Moren, men, 50, 30 of them. Pretty good success. What's well, it's all about, sir, isn't it? Guts, determination, effort. But they really pulled it out of the yes. bag, didn't they? Yes. Surprised us all. Absolutely. Beat the enemy. Got a few worried officers, weren't they? <laughs> Beat the enemy. The enemy is the clock. Well, we haven't, we haven't got there yet, so we've got another syndicate, another nice. two syndicates yeah, to right. Okay. Well um, done! Went back out the champagne just yet. Well done, Slack. That's a fine time. Sir. And the verdict is. It's worth it. You get a nice pasty at the end. Oh, dear, so much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. Yeah, yeah. That was some nice fishing here down at Hexford. Did you see that? Oh, I saw the heron and the buzzards and everything, yeah. Did you? Yeah, yeah. We had, uh, we had Skylark today, Lapwing. <laughs> The hardest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> what can you compare it to? Nothing <laughs> on earth. <laughs> Not bad, eh, son? Still composed at the end of 30 miles. <laughs> Andrew Coulson, the man who said he'd crawl it on hands and knees if necessary, has missed the deadline by just 10 minutes. Don't worry, Maddie. Don't worry. OK, sir, so okay. take him straight in the gate, give him some water, give him a get a hot wet down here. Hey? Huh? Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> come on, here. Here, come on. Let's go, sir, sir, sir. Let's sort it out. Hey? Let's sort it out. The following week, Coulson did a remarkable thing. He ran the 30 miles again, won his green berry, and resigned from the Marines the very next day. Yeah. Do you want to walk around to the back of the telly just to yeah. sit for a second or two in the shade? Yeah. Good, it? So what else is there to do now? Uh, try and stand for attention in front of the brigadier. Yeah. Yeah. Arms up, arms up, sir. Look, to me. Look left. The award of the Green Berets to Wyo, September 1987. Second Lieutenant Ainsworth. Well done, sir. Second Lieutenant Amos. That's it, where you go. Well done, sir. Ainsworth's literally staggering performance means that of the 29 men who started the course 10 months ago, 19 have passed. The yomping may be over for a while, but the learning goes on. The Marines now put to sea with the Royal Navy. HMS Intrepid is a kind of floating fortress that can transport 400 men, tanks, arms and equipment to any part of the world. Well, we've been able to welcome you to a real fighting arm of the Royal Marines, HMS Intrepid. Do enjoy a glass with us. It's our pleasure to have you here and hope you're having a nice... Uh, break and whatever it is you're supposed to be doing and tomorrow we'll try to arrange rain and snow for you but in the meantime enjoy a quiet passage down the west coast and have a beer nice to see you all you will get well intrepid is no mere training ship it first proved its value in a new form of strategic warfare in the falklands campaign in their role as specialist amphibious infantry, the young officers now have to master a whole new range of dangerous toys. Helicopters, landing craft and the high-speed rigid raiders. What they're attacking for the moment are some deserted islands in the Hebrides. The unique idea of officers training alongside their men creates a strong bond between the leader and the led. An officer corps built on the class system would not be appreciated. I get this impression that the type of officer the corps is recruiting now is quite different from even seven or eight years ago. And that um, they're now looking for the, the, real, the right qualities, uh, leadership, uh, determination, courage, fitness. 
about unselfishness, all the, the real qualities of a leader, rather than maybe someone who's come from the right school and uh, speaks with the right accent. And now they're, they're getting guys who really, uh, on, on the face of it, you wouldn't think would be a Royal Marines officer, but they're sometimes the best guys. You know, the, the, the recruits, or the Marines that will be soon, can identify with them, and uh, they'll, they'll follow him anywhere. As they head off for the next stage of their careers, they now have to sustain that rapport without undermining discipline. Here's John Ross taking his first ever inspection. How are you going? Feeling okay? Yes, sir. Good. It's the first time I've done it, and I'm not so sure of the standards at which I should set my, uh, let's say, my ferocity for um, the level of the level of dirt. How angry you meant to get for one piece of fluff? Funny, they're all right. Fine, sir. Good. Good. I have this sort of paranoid feeling that maybe I'm not quite perfect. I keep thinking, you know, maybe I've got some bit of fluff on me and they're going to look at me and think. You just have to overcome that and, uh, and go for it, really. You look at a guy and if he's up to the required standard, then you let him know that, you know. And if he's above it, you know, say, well done, good turnout. And the next guy, who may well be below, uh, and you, you give him the same sort of treatment uh, and bollock him. So delegate down. You can't learn authority from a book. Side, it comes from experience. Is, is and the Royal Marines have a theatrical way of teaching it. Corporal Sir, I am PO 12345 Mike Corporal Bulma. So hold it a minute, Corporal Bulma. Just stand. A metre further back from my desk. And Sir! Start all over again and keep the noise down, OK? Sir, I am PO12345, Mike Sergeant... Uh, wrong! I'll never be a sergeant at this rate, will I, sir? <laughs> Corporal Bulma. Very good, Corporal Bulma. Right, what have you come to see me about? Right, sir, it's about this 365A. Do you mind if I stand at ease, sir? Thank you. Right, sir, Corporal, I've just... stand to attention. I Sir! I will tell you to stand at ease when... That is required, OK? OK, then, sir, if that's where you want it to be. Right, sir, it's about this report. What's this loud and exuberant supposed to mean? <laughs> Dictionary fall open on that page, did it, sir? Loud and exuberant. What, precisely, it, sir? Precisely I mean, me. describes the manner within which you've just come into my office. Keen, sir, that's the trouble. They're you, straight out of training. You reckon they know it all. But they teach you down officer training wing these days. I'm qualified to write that. Not only that, the company commander is qualified to read it and, uh endorse it, which he has done. So well, how can you argue against that? he wouldn't, he wouldn't have endorsed that? it, sir, if you hadn't writ it, would he? Now, no, you but, writ down there, sir, but perfectly he would slagging me off, sir. I'm, I'm, ruining my career, sir. I mean, there you're in, what, for a few years? At the moment, I've got Paul, another well, ten years to serve you, sir. Your deserves to be ruined, OK? Do you understand? Well, no, sir, I you're don't in, at all. You're in serious you, trouble. He's threatening me, sir, Sergeant, he's threatening me. Okay. Getting up to hit me, sir. No, I wasn't getting up to hit you, Corporal. Stand him over, stand him over. St stand me, oh, that's right, thin me out, go on, get me out of the office, just because I'm getting to my next point. Okay, well, get outside, I'm going to go... Well, that's very nice, isn't it? Oh, <laughs> thin me out. All right, overplayed, you know, overacted. I mean, obviously, Court and Simon Bulmer is in the wrong profession. Um, but, I mean, it still does illustrate a number, a number of points, right? The first, what's the first thing in that sort of an interview? Take control, he was getting too mixed yeah. up in him rather than just showing up. Take control. You've got to hold the upper hand, obviously. It's end of term at Limston. The young officers prepare for the summer ball, still doing the donkey work themselves, while awaiting their final reports. Ten months ago, Jim Trotman was apprehensive about ever making it. I was worried how, how I would react under pressure when pressure was placed on me, especially in the field. That's, uh, that's where the uh, Royal Marines job is, in the field, not so much on the parade square nowadays. And um, I was worried about my ability to how I'd, how I'd cope with the field, basically. How I'd cope with the uh, orders, especially as a leadership, I suppose. So what I'd like to do is read you your report. Okay. okay. Trotman's consistent performance in Part 2 training established him as one of the top men in the batch. Affable, sincere and with some humility, Trotman's greatest asset is his personality. Uh, I'm different, really. I work work the military way and when you go back into civilian life you don't really feel part of it um, my mother said to me that um, she, she can see me having enormous problems adjusting back that's why I only joined for a short service <laughs> the only criticism one could offer is that occasionally he might be taken advantage of 
The contest for the Sword of Honour was fierce, and he missed it by a whisker. An excellent year for this able young man. In some ways, you tend to look down upon people in civilian life because they've not done what you've done. And I try to stop myself from doing that because that's wrong. In some ways, I do find myself comparing. I mean, I, I, I don't know, a place with uh, lots of other people, parties or whatever. Nightclubs used to be a, a great one at Christmas, first Christmas leave. You go home and you think, phew, phew, look at them. No, knob ends, you think, no, civvies. And then you think, well, hang on, hang on. I'm, I'm the odd one out here. It's not them. It's me. It's me. I'm different. Why am I thinking like that? And uh, I didn't used to think like that, and I did at Christmas. So and what I did between uh, the summer and Christmas is join the Marines. <laughs> unusual education, compounded of fear, indignity, fatigue and unrelenting pressure. And it's produced 19 examples of precisely what the Royal Marines intended to produce. Officers with brains, courage, resilience and endurance. Battles are not fought to Union hours. They've even learned how to wash their socks, and the man who taught them that, Sergeant Major Williams, returns for their passing out parade. The wrath of God is now a paragon of civility. I remember when one, one, one batch, they marched off, there was an officer with his collar out here. Sorry, Major. Sorry, I've got that wrong. Well, no. Congratulations. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm glad to see you've done very well, actually. Where are you going? Come on, Good. OK. Well, OK, I just hope it stops raining, doesn't it? Yeah. Don't you? A bit worried about your uh, technique. Um, that'll be all right. Sam Brown's looking gleaming. That's all right, isn't it? Yeah, smash smashing. Yeah. Good job. Yeah, fine. So there have been no problems there. Well, I'm just one of us. Thanks very much. I mean, that's sincerely, okay? So I must admit, when you first came here, you know and I know, I didn't think you'd be here today. And you've obviously come through at the end and done very well. And it's not because your dad's a colonel. All right, I know that, and you know that, and I'm sure everybody else knows that. All right, so where are you going? Thanks very much. Where are you going? Four, five. Good. The best luck to you. All right, best luck for us, you clear, right? Thanks very much. Where are you going? I don't really think so much of God, Queen and Country and even personal challenge and things like that. It's Let's get the hell out of here. I was when I was at home this weekend, I, I was just looking through my bookshelf at home and uh, I came across the, the POC recruiting magazine and I read through it, all the things that it said about why they're training. And it was rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I it just, I, it, I was reading through it and it brought back the feelings I had before I joined, not really knowing what was going to happen. And it, it glamorised the whole thing. And that is one thing that training is not. Don't come here trying to clock up all the sort of great scout badges like thinking I'm, uh, I must be a, a great canoeist. I've got to be captain of the first 15 at rugby. Um, I've got to be an all singing, all dancing, you know, lead from the front, um, sporty, that sort of individual. Um, it comes across a little bit too harshly. I think you've got to come here with an open mind and you've got to be able to keep that mind open while you're here. That's the important thing. You can play the hard, slightly detached, sort of officerly-like officer image, um, and lean on a little bit of unapproachability, so that, you know, obviously the, the message won't come through to you that the troop isn't, or whoever, isn't, isn't, isn't performing as well as it should. And I hope I'll never let that happen. Um, you've got to keep in touch with the blokes. They're very important. And uh, if you're not in touch with them, then, uh, you know, heaven help you on the day of the race. I'm patriotic, but uh, I'm not doing the job for that reason. You know, I'm doing it for, well, as I said, leading people, really. We're not all right-wing thugs, as people make out. And especially, I think, people do try and encourage us to be in, to think about the things we're doing. Uh, sometimes you have to do things which are wrong in the eyes of many, but you do it because you've joined up and that's what you're supposed to do. I perhaps have a slightly uh, 
childish, I suppose, uh, idea of heroism and this sort of thing. Nice. But, uh, and I think I'll also get some sort of kick out of it. That makes me sound like some sort of pervert. But uh, I think, again, it goes back to the leading bit, leading guys in action. It's the worst possible situation you can ever lead anyone in. And to be good at it would personally make me feel, in my own mind, that I've done a pretty good job and uh, I've done something which is much harder than what a lot of other people do. I just hope it stops raining. I don't think there's any chance of that. The Sword of Honour is presented by Lieutenant General Sir Martin Garrett, Commandant General of the Royal Marines. Sir, the young officer batch of September 1987 is fallen in in three ranks at open order and awaits your inspection. I don't in myself think uh, I'm far and away the best. I think I'm one of the best in the batch, but uh, I think it could have gone another way. Very much. Very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Oh, I love it. 